Good morning. So let's start uh, today's uh, program. So it's a pleasure to have the first talk by John Imbri, his second lecture on uh, MBL. <coughs> so welcome, everyone. I'm, um, as you know, I'm, um, <coughs> my task today is to uh, build on what we talked about yesterday, all the techniques we developed in the context of the Anderson model. And we want to show how they <coughs> can be applied quite um, explicitly in the MBL uh, context for the one-dimensional MBL problem. And uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, these two papers were written the same year. Um, and pretty much I had one paper here on my, the one the non-interacting problem here on my left, and I was writing the paper on my right. I was just following it step by step. Um, so hopefully um, you can see how this uh, translates um, in today's talk. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, this is now lecture two, and so I'm gonna talk about the competing effects of the density of non-perturbative regions. And this is a critical aspect uh, we'll get into later about how, um, uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, when they're, these non-perturbative regions are isolated, they can be effectively eliminated in the RG, but they, leave behind a trace in the sense that they tend to reduce the exponential decay rate. Um, and you have to maintain a minimum rate of exponential decay in order for the procedure to continue. Um, so anyway, <coughs> uh, let's get started. By, by the way, before I do actually get started, let me just, uh, since there was this question yesterday, I wanted to, I didn't answer it very well. Some, some folks asked me about whether some of the uh, methods that I talked about yesterday could be applied to the beta lattice, Anderson model on the beta lattice. <clears throat> and I wasn't sure, but um, <clears throat> I do believe that they would apply to the beta lattice. But in fact, there is an extensive literature in the mathematics uh, community um, establishing an, a number of key results on the beta lattice, which I forgot to mention yesterday. So. There certainly are results on localization on the beta lattice. There's actually a result going back, I don't know, 20 years, Klein and collaborators on delocalization on the beta lattice, which is, uh, as you probably know, <coughs> mathematicians have a much harder time proving delocalization than they have proving localization, but the beta lattice is a notable exception. Um, and this is a paper which uh, was written in 2011 it was a very um, important paper because it's actually an interesting phenomenon that which, which uh, Eisenman and Wurzel identified whereby <laughs> depending upon the branching ratio in the beta lattice and the rate of exponential decay that you see in the eigenfunctions, depending upon <laughs> which is stronger, the growth or the exponential decay, you can actually have delocalization um, because there are so many possible um, spots for a, um, a given site to resonate with if the, <clears throat> if the branching ratio was high enough um, that the, that actually beats out the exponential decay rate. And so you have this in, these interesting phase of um, where the eigenfunctions are spread out, but they're uh, in fact extremely sparse on the beta lattice. So a very nice result uh, appeared in um, Journal of the European Math Society uh, sometime after this. So definitely worth looking at. But anyway, today I'm gonna um, <clears throat> talk about the goals for a proof of MBL and then get basically uh, go through the same steps that I went through yesterday uh, in the context of the Anderson model. Um, so let me just give a brief introduction to the phenomenology of MBL. Most of you, you're aware of all of this, but uh, let me just mention some key aspects, absence of transport, some kind of Anderson localization and configuration space, for example, using IPR measures, entanglement by area law, and violation of ETH, absence of level repulsion and logarithmic growth of entanglement for initial product state. Uh, I'm, I can't really address all of these with my proof, but I, can definitely get into the violation of ETH and also the existence of the 
LIM is the local integrals of motion. <laughs> the model that I'm taking was kind of custom designed to make it as easy as possible for me to write this proof. Um, so what we have here is a um, model similar to the ones that had been considered at, at the time, um, <clears throat> but with some small differences. What we have here is um, SC here and here in this, the nearest neighbor term is SC and the, and the um, on-site term is SC. And then we have a hopping term. I call it a hopping term, but really it's a spin flipping term. Uh, it's the only off-diagonal term in the Hamiltonian. It's proportional to SX. So what, the idea is with this, um, <clears throat> if the distribution of these random parameters, H, gamma, and J are very wide, then typically um, you have a strong um, push towards um, the spin being up or down. And most of the time. And then you have this small flipping term, which can flip it from one to the other. Uh, it's actually important that I have all three terms in the Hamiltonian be, um, be random. Uh, the reason for that is maybe a little bit technical, but uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll get into this later when I talk about block resonances. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, I still, although these are random parameters here, this off this flipping term, which is the, basically the term that I'm going to perturb in, I'm going to say that it's <clears throat> identify a single number, little uh, gamma without a subscript, which multiplies the random distribution with gamma small. So there's going to be one parameter, little gamma, which I'm going to take extremely small in order to produce the MBL um, result. And all the other random variables just have some fixed distribution with bounded densities. Um, <clears throat> so talking about the LIAMs, um, <clears throat> uh, how would we know if a system has a complete set of quasi-local LIAMs? Uh, well, how would you construct them? The idea is that you need a quasi-local unitary that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. What does quasi locality mean? It means that the effect of U on a set of spins that spans the distance L in the lattice should be very close to the identity up to exponentially small corrections in L. But importantly, there's also an allowance here. This is a, um, you can't, you, if that were the <laughs> extent of your definition of quasi locality, then nothing would ever satisfy it. You have to allow for rare non proliferating regions where the property fails. These are the resonant regions. So if you're able to do this, this is part of the main goal of the proof is to produce this quasi local unitary that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. Then you can take the spin operators and do essentially the reverse rotation as what you did to the Hamiltonian to diagonalize it. And then it's clear that the Hamiltonian commutes with these tau i's. Uh, because you can undo those rotations and you end up, we're talking about the commutator of, a di of two diagonal matrices, which of course is zero. And similarly, the commutator of the LIAMs is zero. So that means these are uh, the integrals of motion that have been discussed in great deal over the years. And um, so anyway, so, um, <clears throat> Now, heuristically, um, what are we trying to do? We're, we're basically, it's kind of a many body version of a phenomenon that's very familiar for two by two matrices, right? We, if the off diagonal piece is very small, then the eigenfunctions are close to one, zero, and zero, one. That's pretty obvious. Uh, if this gamma here were random or something like that, or if it happened to be close to zero, well, then the eigenfunctions would be spread out, if you will. They would be hybridized. And when this happens, there's no meaningful way to associate eigenfunctions with the basis vectors. Here, even if, uh, as long as gamma is small, you can identify um, the basis vector with one zero, even though it's slightly off from one zero. But in this situation, there's no meaningful way to define 
limes, you can arbitrarily associate um, one of these vectors with that and the other with that if you would like. All right, so <clears throat> there have been constructions of limes perturbatively. This, this, most of this lecture I'm citing goes back to the early days of MPL. Um, but the goal here is to really to do it non-perturbatively. Uh, in fact, these rare regions where perturbation theory breaks down do have the potential to spoil MBL. Um, and so what I'm going to outline is a non-perturbative construction, which, however, I, it's not a complete proof in the sense that it doesn't have, I do have to make this one assumption, kind of like sometimes mathematicians will assume the Riemann hypothesis and prove a bunch of stuff. Um, so here I'm assuming a, a level spacing assumption and um, essentially that level spacings of a system of n n's are no smaller than some exponential in L. Uh, now, <clears throat> as we know, there's been a lot of controversy and people questioning the numerical evidence for MPL. Uh, and so that really makes it all that much more important that um, if the numerical evidence is ambiguous, or some people would even say it's irrelevant to the infinite volume aspects of the MBL problem. Um, it's really especially important to have a non-perturbative proof. And that's what I'm gonna be discussing today. All right, let me get back to this level spacing assumption. Um, so if we consider the Hamiltonian in a box of size N, then its eigenvalue should satisfy a minimum level spacing condition. The probability that the minimum level spacing is smaller than delta um, should be <coughs> bounded by delta the nu times c to the n for some nu. So if you, th so if you think about this, uh, this is telling you, uh, really you have to take delta to be some exponentially small number, otherwise, otherwise it'll just be, um, probabilities are always bounded by one, right? So <laughs> this isn't saying anything unless delta is itself exponentially small. And uh, essentially this is saying that the eigenvalue statistics are no worse than the common distributions that we talk about. Poisson would correspond to nu equals one. And actually, um, if you have GOE or something like that, well, that would be nu equals two, I believe. Uh, this even allows for nu, to be smaller than one, which would be some kind of level attraction. That's why I call it limited level attraction because it's, it's even okay for these levels to attract one another as long as a uh, exponentially, um, as long as their spacings are no smaller than exponential in N. And to violate that, you would really need to have some, I don't know, some special symmetry or something which would create degeneracies. Um, most people are, happy to accept this as a reasonable condition. And there really haven't been any exceptions that have been uh, pointed out. <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I, I think typically when you when you draw a curve representing the level spacing statistics, you've already factored out this exponentially small factor, right? So, <laughs> yeah, as long as once you factor out the exponential and n, you just have some reasonable distribution. That's all you need. Yeah. Um, this is the, the many body Aubrey Andre or the, um, okay. Well, um, well, I guess in, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the, with that, um, model, but, um, since the level spacings can't be any worse than the power of n, I would think it would satisfy this, but 
um, unless there's some degeneracies um, that are built in because of special symmetries of the Aubriandre. Okay. There is some clustering of some. Okay. So, yeah, as I said, there, some, there is some clustering permitted in this, as long as the, you still maintain essentially an exponential, uh, some kind of lower bound on the minimum spacing, which is an exponential in N. So probably that's the case as well for Aubrey Andre. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, I think of this as primarily a percolation problem. Uh, it may seem strange uh, when we talk about a spin system, but really it's, a, it's all about percolation of resonances. And um, uh, the resonances are, as we saw yesterday, the main impediment to developing convergent perturbation series. And as long as the resonances uh, don't percolate in an appropriate sense, then um, that leads directly to these um, quasi-locality and the existence of the lion. So let me just uh, run through some of the things that um, are demonstrated in, in my proof. If you assume the LLA condition, then you have a, a labeling system for eigenstates by spin, or I also introduced this term metaspin because of this ambiguity that I said, when you have hybridization, there's no, uh, you know, obvious way to associate standard basis vectors with the eigenfunctions. But if you just pick one, we call that a metaspin. Um, or if we have a resonant region, instead of thinking of that, let's say you have a, a resonant region of, of five sites on the lattice, then there's two to the five configurations, and you could just arbitrarily say that those um, 32 possible configurations are the possible values of a metaspin in that resonant spot. Um, <clears throat> we have faster than power law decay of the probability of resonant blocks. That's a key concept which I introduced for quasi-locality. Note this is not an exponential decay, um, but faster than power law decay is perfectly adequate for um, the quasi-locality and, and for just uh, obtaining all the non-thermalization results in this paper. Um, then I diagonalize the Hamiltonian via sequence of local rotations defined via converging graphical expansions with exponential bounds. Um, and then local observables, uh, their expectations uh, is close to their naive gamma equals zero values. So it's been, you take a, an expectation of a spin variable in an eigenstate, it, going to be at least away from a resonant region, it's going to be very close to one or minus one, just as in that two by two matrix example. And then we have exponential decay of truncated expectations, again, except for a set of rapidly decaying probability. And uh, <clears throat> various other properties, but let's uh, move on to the theorem. Uh, we assume the level of spacing conditions then as a particular example, we can take the expectation value over the disorder, the average over the eigenstates of SC at the origin, let's say, in that eigenstate. And if you take its absolute values, I'm claiming it's close to one or minus one. If you take its absolute value, it's going to be close to one with corrections some power of gamma. And then we have exponential decay if you take truncated expectations in an eigenfunction. And all these bounds uniform in the box. Uh, so in particular, these, this result implies that there's no thermalization. If you take, say, infinite temperature, so this average over the eigenstates is a uniform weighting. I didn't say, but this average can be pretty much any average you'd like. But if you take a uniform weighting, that corresponds to infinite temperature. And so then with thermalization, these averages would go to zero. 
uh, the spin variable should be equally likely to be up or down, so its expectation should be zero. But this contradicts the statement right here, which says it's close to one or minus one. Another consequence uh, is that essentially all the eigenstates have a non-uniform spatial distribution of energy, which persists for all time, so you don't really have any transport. Okay, so now let me get into the proof. I'm gonna, as I said, I'm following the ideas in the single body problem. There the off diagonal term in the problem was this hopping, the nearest neighbor hopping. But here the off diagonal term is um, a spin flip operator, a local operator. Um, so we can start by looking at single flip resonances. Uh, so if we were to take a spin configuration sigma and to flip that, so this is a classical spin configuration, just a set of ones and minus ones. If we were to flip um, the uh, spin at I, then we get an associated energy change, which is E sigma minus E sigma of I. And this, uh, this E sigma really, or this energy difference really just depends upon uh, <clears throat> not only the magnetic field at the side I, but it also, because of the nearest neighbor term, it also depends on the configuration of the neighbor spin. So there's four possibilities for the neighbor spins. Let me just uh, draw this. If we have this spin that we're flipping, and then we have the neighbor spins, and there's four possibilities for these neighbor spins that each gives you a possible energy shift. And in general, you know, I don't really care. Factors of four are nothing to me. So I just say the side is resonant uh, if the change in energy is smaller than this epsilon, which we saw yesterday as well, or at least, I guess I need to mute myself. There's something, maybe an echo. Um, you can still hear me okay? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the, um, uh, <clears throat> so I take this power of the main perturbation parameter gamma, I call that epsilon. And if for at least one choice of the neighboring spins gives you a resonance, that is the change in energy is smaller than epsilon, then we call that site resonant. Uh, so then the ratio gamma over delta E is going to be smaller than gamma to the 1920th for non-resonant sites. So <laughs> the probability of having resonant sites is roughly four epsilon, and they, so they form a very dilute set where perturbation theory breaks down. And we may go ahead and rotate away the interaction terms, um, which is this off diagonal part of the Hamiltonian for non-resonant sites by defining this rotation generator. Same formula that I gave yesterday for the Anderson model. Um, <coughs> A of I is given by, its matrix elements are given by this J matrix. Um, <coughs> the off diagonal part of the Hamiltonian divided by the delta E. <coughs> Then we apply this rotation to the Hamiltonian. We get the renormalized Hamiltonian. We get a, I guess it's called the Vial series, I believe. Uh, <coughs> and um, the key point is that the, um, we, the resonant part of the Hamiltonian remains because we didn't wrote, we only did this on non-resonant sites. But away from the resonant sites, we have a renormalized interaction. J is now essentially quadratic in gamma, the only just slightly off of being quadratic because this um, <coughs> ratio not being a full power of gamma, but just slightly less. So once again, we're tr basically trying to um, produce a Newton's method type arrangements, a um, <coughs> quadratically convergent procedure, which is, uh, or nearly quadratically converging procedure, which is um, based on a discrete 
RG in this problem. And now once, uh, as I said, the quadratic and higher order, um, <clears throat> now we have locality in this problem. So A of I commutes with A of J or J of J if the distance from I to J is greater than one. All right, so actually I minus J equals to one. You do have um, non-commutativity because um, if I take these three spins and if I flip this spin, that changes the energy associated with the flipping of this spin, right? So it depends on the order in which I split, flip these spins. So the nearest neighbors um, do have a non-commutativity. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in fact, so what happens is when you, when you do this series, uh, um, the Lee Schwinger series, <laughs> you get um, graphs which uh, essentially proceed through nearest neighbor steps or sometimes through <clears throat> staying in the same place. But they, because only the only, you need nearest neighbor in order to be non-commuting, so you step from step to step. The result is that you have a walk in physical space. Of course, <clears throat> uh, in spin configuration, space, you also have a walk because every time you flip a spin, you apply one of these matrices, A or J, uh, you're changing the spin configuration. So you have a walk in spin configuration space, but it projects down to a walk in physical space, which consists of nearest neighbor steps. So this is the nature of the graphical expansion. And so when I talk about a graph G, it's exactly that. It's a graph consisting of steps in spin configuration space, which, which project down to physical space um, with a more familiar type of walk. But ultimately, as in the, many, in the single body problem, what you're doing is multiplying matrices and these graphs are essentially just keeping track of the indices when you multiply matrices. All right, so then we want to define our resonant blocks by taking connected components of the set of sites belonging to resonant graphs. And as in the last lecture, we, we were just following the procedures of quasi-degenerate perturbation theory. So you just diagonalize in these, um, in these resonant blocks. Exactly. You, all, <coughs> um, you don't know much about that. The, the matrix that does that diagonalization, but we just know it exists. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we'd only do this on the small isolated resonant blocks. Again, we, as in the one body problem, we had, <clears throat> we had to run the RG on the resonant blocks as well as on the graphical expansions. We couldn't try to diagonalize initially an extremely large block. Um, uh, because uh, essentially we need to isolate that block from its environment before it can be properly diagonalized in a way that wouldn't have to be corrected in future steps of the procedure. <clears throat> All right, so now let me um, talk about the graphical analysis. And this figure, in fact, is identical to one that I put up on the screen yesterday. We also can, in this procedure, we're using the same sequence of length scales, 15 eighths to the K. And we continue rotating away interactions of order lower than gamma to the LK. So essentially the op interactions, um, of course they get produced anytime you do the Lee Schwinger oper operation, you get an infinite series. So although initially the interactions are simply gamma, sigma X, uh, once you do these least stringer rotations, you get a whole infinite series, which however decays exponentially away from the resonant blocks. So you get many, many terms in the Hamiltonian with all different orders in gamma, but they're all convergent series. But what we do is we take all the, of the terms between gamma to the LK uh, up to gamma to the uh, 15 eighths LK or LK plus one, all those terms are swept away by the Lee-Schwinger rotation in the kth step. And the result is that um, after the rotation is performed, the minimum order of the remaining action uh, operators 
in the Hamiltonian is of order at least gamma to the 2 LK, or, or really gamma to the LK plus 1. <clears throat> Graphically, this, at each step, the um, interaction is a sum of connected graphs, which connect one spin configuration to another, um, <clears throat> where, they project, where they project down to a graph in physical space, G. And so we can uh, draw the same sort of picture of a, these solid lines represent, um, most of them are going to be A matrices. And if we're talking about J, one of those would be um, the J matrix. So, so anyway, we have a J, sorry, the solid lines represent a J interaction and the arches denote uh, energy denominators essentially from as a you see here a is always given by j divided by the energy denominators so this is the way the perturbation theory looks we have a bunch of energy denominators you see the way i've structured this is we sort of have short arches representing nearest neighbor steps that's what you get in the first step of the procedure then in the second step of the procedure maybe you get next nearest neighbor interactions and associated energy denominators and then the subsequent step, you may have a connection that goes over four, and then eight, 16. Um, so these energy denominators, there's always the same number of energy denominators as there are steps, but the scale over which this energy denominator um, extends uh, is kind of uh, organized in a, kind of in a multi-scale fashion mirroring the multi-scale nature of the construction. <clears throat> However, um, <clears throat> these very long distance energy denominators are not something to be feared. We had them already in the single body problem. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there's kind of a, a <laughs> the fact that the integral of, um, the integral dv over v to the one half, let's say, is less than infinity, let's say from minus one to one. This is essentially a um, multi-scale bound, right? <laughs> because the, the zero denominator goes all the way to zero, but it's integrable. So we get a multi-scale control um, over, <clears throat> over the problem, which is a key aspect of the procedure. So these long, di uh, arches are not something to be feared. They're controlled using the um, fractional moment bounds that I discussed yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, the question was when I'm doing uh, uh, this, there's uh, at each step of the procedure, do I renormalize the on-site energy? So, yes, I do. And I, I, did the, I do that as well. You see here I denote um, <clears throat> these energies with a superscript K because they've been actually renormalized through perturbation theory up to the appropriate order. Yeah. Well, so we used the renormalized energy. This is something that I, uh, I swept under the rug yesterday, but we're doing it as well in the single body problem, renormalizing the energies. And um, so when we define the notion of resonance, we use the renormalized energies to define resonance. And so that's a very important point that you, you raised. Uh, when you go to very high order in perturbation theory, um, it's extremely unproductive to use the bare energies as a notion of, re of resonance, right? Well, um, uh, 
maybe the, I don't know if you're familiar with, the, so the question was, um, uh, how do I know this is sort of self-consistent and that uh, the definition of what's resonant, what's non-resonant uh, departs from what's real. Maybe if I paraphrase what you said. Um, as a good example for this type of procedure is in the KM theory where you also have a whole issue of resonance, to do, big issues with resonance is there in KEM theory. Um, <clears throat> uh, but if you look in details in the KEM type arguments, uh, you keep shifting what you're perturbing about, right? You, so you develop these um, um, canonical uh, transformations up to some order in perturbation theory and then you use that perturbation theory to define the associated um, energies, if you will. And that because you've identified the energies to that degree of precision, it then makes sense to talk about the next order in perturbation theory. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing in quantum mechanics. If you want to know uh, whether um, an interaction of order, let's say, gamma to the 10th, uh, what are the, the notion of the energies involved which determine resonance have to be uh, determined up to some order, maybe gamma to the fifth or something like that. Uh, as long as the, you keep progressing the order to which you define the energies, it, um, then you're actually talking about the relevant precision or the order of perturbation theory to which you're working. Uh, so this is a little bit of a technical part of the procedure. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that comes about is here, because of these energies are not the original um, <clears throat> magnetic fields, uh, there's actually a Jacobian that needs to be considered where you make a change of variables from the magnetic fields to these energies so that you can um, then proceed and do this type of estimate with respect to these new integration variables. Um, but like pretty much everything else in this problem, as long as you stay away from the resonant set, um, everything is perturbative, including the Jacobian that describes the change of variables between the original magnetic fields and these um, energies here. Yes. Um, say, say that again, I'm sorry. Well, um, he asked whether the level repulsion, uh, that whether that has to be renormalized. Well, no, um, <laughs> the level repulsion bound uh, let me go back to the LLA slide. Um, this is saying we have a statement for boxes of size n. So obviously n can be anywhere from zero to infinity. So I'm making a, an assumption, an initial assumption for boxes of every size. And I'm, so I'm not going to modify this assumption with the RG. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so this, this assumption, I'm not making an assumption about my perturbatively generated energies. This assumption, maybe I didn't make that perfectly clear. This is, these are the exact energies of the Hamiltonian in, the, in a box of size N. Yeah, so in fact, I don't use LLA coming back to the slide and you see here this E sigma K, E sigma tilde K. These are the perturbatively generated energies and I'm actually not applying the LLA to those. These I have full control over using perturbation theory. 
I don't need to make any assumptions about them. It's the situations in the resonant blocks that I lose control over and for which I need to apply LLA. Uh, but yeah, very, very um, receptive questions. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you've been uh, asking them. Okay, so getting back to this, uh, we have a uh, rotation generator, which looks a lot like um, the one talked about yesterday. We say that this graph of order K is resonant if the generator is greater than gamma over epsilon to the LK. And uh, of course, <laughs> now if you remember yesterday, I also had the second condition. It was only for long graphs, which were <laughs> Uh, very nearly stretched out straight. And there's a similar condition here, but, I, but I'm not writing it because I didn't want to get to that degree of technicality. <clears throat> so um, fractional moment bounds, as in the single body case, and the Markov inequality, inequality imply the probability that G is resonant likewise decays exponentially in L which means it's okay then to sum over, there's always an exponential number of graphs in a given order. <clears throat> Let me get in, I think in the next slide I have a show the Markov inequality in a little more detail, uh, at least in the case where you have uh, straight graphs that don't repeat sites. Um, so which was the, <clears throat> in the forward approximation, if you will. So, <clears throat> We have fractional moment bound. We take this generator, we take it to the S power. S is smaller than one. And the bound is exponential in the length of the graph G. Uh, times a product of these integrals over the energy differences to the power S, as I was talking about, these are gonna be bounded by a constant. Again, subject to this uh, <laughs> change of variable business of, uh, that I alluded to uh, in response to the previous question. <laughs> so the bottom line is, uh, uh, <clears throat> in expectation, these generators, when taken to the S power, have a bound which decays exponential in the length of the graph. Um, <clears throat> now these delta E's are essentially the sum of the H's for slight flip between sigma and sigma tilde. Um, <clears throat> And so it's a little more complicated than the single body problem where really I literally just had, you know, um, uh, one over the potential at a site to integrate over. But, um, but <clears throat> the key point as far as this is concerned is uh, that is the independence of the magnetic fields. As soon as a, as a walk returns to a previously visited site, then the, uh, when you take the sum of the magnetic fields, there's a constraint, they add up, um, um, well, if you have a graph which returns to where it started, the sum of the magnetic fields is zero or something like that. So um, <clears throat> once you introduce a constraint, then the dimensionality of the integral is reduced and you no longer have this, this bound. So we have to talk about the forward approximation. But if anyway, if we take this within the forward approximation, we apply Markov inequality, it states that the quantity under the expectation is bounded exponentially with the probability one minus some epsilon to the length of the graph. So except for a set of exponentially small probability, we have an exponential bound on the rotation generator, just as we saw yesterday in the one body problem. Yes. So, yeah, it, well, it has to be a number less than one. I, it's like, for some more obscure reasons, I think it was two sevenths or something like that in my paper, but just some number less than one. Yeah, obviously, it needs to be less than one, otherwise this uh, integral would not be finite. Okay, so now let me get into the forward approximation. Um, 
The moment method breaks down for walks that return to previously visited sites in physical space. Um, <clears throat> so there are complications. Um, <clears throat> if, if the graph involves a significant number of repeated spin flips, uh, then there's, these are actually uh, easier to, in some sense to handle because you don't need to use, if you have a large number of repetitions, it means the walk is not extending over a very large distance in physical space. It's sort of crinkled up, right? Doesn't get very far. <laughs> and as in the discussion yesterday, um, if I talk about decay in terms of physical distance rather than in graphical distance, uh, I'm actually ahead of the game for these graphs that have repeated returns. Uh, but yeah, when you have repetitions, then um, you get larger powers of one over the magnetic field and eventually the power will exceed one and then this, these integrals will diverge. But backtracking sections where the walk returns to previously visited sites can be handled with L infinity bounds. That is just uniform, not probabilistic bounds. Uh, as they have a greater decay rate which, which arises from the greater decay degree of connectivity of such graphs. And this phenomenon we already saw yesterday. And so hopefully um, uh, you get a sense of um, how that can help out in this case as well. It's really the same mechanism that, that I developed in the one body problem and applied here to deal with this important issue. Okay, so <clears throat> Now, another key aspect is what happens with the blocks and the LLA condition. So uh, we, we had some pictures yesterday where, where the walk would be moving along through space and it would hit a resonant block and the exponential decay would cease over the block and so on. So this is the, the situation that I'm considering here now in the many body context. <laughs> um, so one of the things that can happen is that one block over here can be resonant with another block over there. Um, <clears throat> you know, what, the way we go, when, when, as the RG runs, and effectively you can try to rescale space, these blocks essentially contract. They're, eventually they're considered as individual sites. Um, and so then we have to once again, start doing perturbation theory that corresponds to interactions between different blocks or between a block and a spin in the environment somewhere. Um, and once we start doing perturbation theory with blocks, then we need to know what the probability of a resonance is with that block, right? As I said yesterday, we never do perturbation theory unless you know it's convergent. That's the number one rule in this procedure how are we going to do perturbation theory involving non-perturbative regions? Well, <clears throat> we do have this LLA level spacing assumption, which gives non-perturbative non control on the probability of a resonance between this block and that one. Uh, <clears throat> because if you take the level spacings of one of these blocks and you, <clears throat> um, and you consider the space of random perturbations, this is where that comes in, the fact that I have all three terms in the Hamiltonian are random. Amongst those <coughs> random perturbations in the Hamiltonian, there constitutes a kind of breather mode where the Hamiltonian just scales up and down by a constant factor, which means then the level spacing also scale up and down by a constant factor, a random factor rather. That means <coughs> that the probability that this block resonance, that there's a level spacing in this block, which happens to uh, agree with the level spacing in that block is gonna be small probabilistically. So that's where the LLA assumption comes in. It, it handles these block block resonances, which otherwise I would have no control over. All right, so now let me move on to um, 
this issue of basically the avalanche effect and where the, do you see it in the proof? So if you have a resonant region, and we saw this already yesterday, I had to put a buffer zone around the region um, so that if you have an interaction which extends beyond the buffer zone, the power of the interaction gamma to the L will uh, beat, if you will, the number of states in the region two to the L. In fact, it needs to be not only two to the L, but actually two to the L prime, where L prime is the entire width of this zone, including both of these buffer zones. So as we, as we saw earlier, and I claimed earlier, this was basically the, um, the fact that a resonant region tends to thermalize a region um, out to some distance. And if, it's, if you're in a thermalized situation, then you have, you know, um, you can't really hope to use um, perturbation theory as I've been doing. So this entire region has to be avoided from the point of view of perturbation theory. Um, now in one dimension, this is what's special about one dimension, the buffer zone has a volume comparable to that of the resonant block. So it's possible to diagonalize the Hamiltonian in the combined region, uh, eliminating internal interactions because di it's a diagonal matrix, while keeping the level spacing larger than the interactions with spins outside. So this arrow here indicates an interaction to a spin outside. It's gamma to the L, and gamma is much smaller than the level spacing in this combined region. So this is how we deal with the um, potential uh, avalanche phenomenon. Well, it's part of, this is basically uh, the avalanche phenomenon in action, but it's showing that we have the potential for halting the avalanche provided um, we use these buffer, buffer zones. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. These buffer zones in, in let's say, two dimensions, the volume would be, instead of exponential in L, it'd be an exponential in L squared. And of course, this distance here is always an exponential in L by itself. So you can't be, beat an exponential in L squared with an exponential in L. And in some sense, this is right. This is borderline, right? To, if you think about it. Um, <coughs> Um, you know, it's kind of like four dimensions for gauge theory or two dimensions for ON models. You run at the borderline and you get some interesting sort of logarithmic phenomena, um, which make the problem much uh, more interesting at a theoretical level, but create nightmares for people like myself, mathematicians, trying to prove theorems. All right, so um, I, I think that's pretty much all I'm going to say at the moment for the, um, about these resonant regions, but I'll get back to that after I cover this other issue. Uh, I see I'm running a little bit later than I thought, but um, hopefully I'll finish in by roughly 10.30. Um, so we need to preserve exponential decay, as I've said. Uh, but resonant blocks interrupt or short circuit the exponential decay along graphs, which leads to a reduction in the overall decay rate. That's this picture here. Um, <laughs> the decay is along these lines, but there's no decay on the resonant block itself. So this was termed the rule of halted decay in one of these uh, papers of um, the Roque and his collaborators on the avalanche theory. Um, <laughs> so the the key point is that um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, these resonant blocks have a tendency to push the decay rate down. So um, <coughs> following this old paper of Froelich and Spencer, this effect can be kept under control by gathering blocks into loosely connected groups separated by large gaps with uninterrupted decay. This is the point is to produce these uninterrupted decays. Um, and because of the spacing between these blocks, 
which is enforced. These distances are enforced, right? So you don't have this situation where they pile up and you have lots of short, short circuits in a row, which would lead to a, uh, a really <laughs> an extreme loss of exponential decay. As long as these guys are spaced out sufficiently, then the decay in the intermediate zones will make up for the loss of decay uh, in the block regions. So if we have, um, at some scale, we have these blocks that are very well separated apart. <clears throat> but these are slightly too close for comfort. They're more like this. So I join them up and I form um, a combination block here. And I've done that in these four cases. And then I'll say, oh, these guys are a little bit too close for comfort. So I'll join those up. I'll join those block up. And then I'll join everything up. So this gives me a very loosely connected grouping of resonant blocks. And the decay rate, although these individual pieces have exponential decay, clearly we're missing a lot of the decay in this whole area. Probabilistic decay I'm talking about. Um, however, this procedure is so uh, is sufficiently well connected that the probability decay remains faster than power law. And I can go to the, into the details of that later if you wish, but um, um, <clears throat> what this, this explains how the uh, percolation connectivity function, which is defined using this broader notion of connections, actually has a faster than power law decay, which means these resonant blocks now in this generalized sense are very dilute and with the rapidly decaying percolation connectivity function. Um, <clears throat> so in RG terms, um, when we do these rotations, removing the terms in the Hamiltonian, it's analogous to integrating out short distance degrees of freedom in traditional RG. Uh, at the same time, the resonant regions up to some scale are, they have to be eliminated or effectively renormalized away once L is large enough so that the remaining interaction terms are smaller than the level spacing. This is with this buffer zone total size R plus 2L. That's the picture I had a, a couple of slides ago. And at that point, the region hosts a metaspin, which takes values due to the R plus 2L values. But the interactions are so small that there's little hybridization with spins elsewhere. OK, so this paragraph is about this picture here. These interactions here are so small that this resonant region does not hybridize with the spins outside or with other resonant blocks outside. Deep in the localist region, this RG has the property that the density of remaining regions, including their buffer zones, uh, goes to zero with L. That's obviously a key thing. We need these um, the densities to go to zero. If it doesn't go to zero, then we don't have MBL. But there are two effects in play. The, the small resonant regions are eliminated or, or you know, the quasi-degenerate perturbation theory diagonalized away. When you eliminate blocks, that reduces their density. But the fattening of the buffer zones um, uh, by putting on these neighborhoods has a tendency to increase the density. But the proof shows that the elimination dominates the fattening deep in the weak coupling strong disorder. And the density goes to zero as L goes to infinity. And actually, um, uh, I should say that <coughs> these two effects are going to actually the same effects which come into play in tomorrow's lecture when I talk about the RG for the, um, the transition point. You want to understand the critical behavior, at least heuristically. Um, you have these same phenomena at play there. And <clears throat> in one phase, the density goes to zero. And the other phase, the density grows without limit. Um, so, uh, that's, so we'll look forward to tomorrow's lecture for that. So finally, let me just conclude by saying that uh, we found that the resonant regions are rare. And the rotation generators exhibit exponential decay away from the resonant regions. And so with high probability, local observables take values close to what they would be in the original tensor product basis. That's 
what I said in the int introductions. And the LIMs are defined by applying those rotations to the original spin variables. Now, you may ask, well, <coughs> um, about the relevance of this whole proof. After all, <coughs> this MBL theorem states that an infinite volume MBL phase exists for gamma sufficiently small, but it doesn't say how small. And if you really tried to work it out, it would, I'm sure it would be a very depressing number, you know, 10 to the minus 9 or something. Partly, as I was discussing yesterday, because, uh, you know, I'm, I wasn't trying to optimize the proof for um, from the point of view of allowing the largest possible region for the NBL phase to take place. I was only interested in showing that there exists an NBL phase. Um, <laughs> but if you look at the mechanisms in the proof, it's clear that the Resonant regions are creating stored circuits that depress the decay rate. So the initial decay rate had better be pretty large so that after all these depressions through each step of the RG, we know it's a conversion series, but we don't, <laughs> we're not exactly sure what the sum is. We have to start with a sufficiently rapid decay so that after losing a fair chunk of that decay, we still have a sufficient decay, uh, which remains above the threshold for avalanches. And so recent studies have confirmed uh, this, uh, that, <clears throat> yeah, the threshold uh, for the MBL phase is indeed uh, quite far out parametrically. Uh, and that's just uh, seems to be the way it is. Some people may take this as a criticism of the phenomenon, but for me, uh, as more of a theoretician, I find it an extremely rich phenomenon that is worthy of study. It's analogous to, you know, just like saying asymptotic freedom is, um, <clears throat> uh, is problematical because it says that you can't discuss quarks using perturbation theory, right? I mean, <laughs> the theory is rich, right? So. <laughs> It makes it interesting from the uh, from the theoretician's perspective, um, and indeed the transition uh, is has a lot of interesting structure, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, the earlier you know the early days of NBL, people were looking at the transition just in boxes of size twenty, and they said, "Well, it has to be here." And now we learn that it must be over here. But remember this proof, uh, okay, this proof was in 2014. So um, the seeds of this push out to a very large value for the transition were already present in my paper. Um, this has been made, made much more quantitative in recent studies, but it, it's, um, yeah, it's not really an enormous surprise, at least it wasn't to me. And, um, uh, and okay, you can say, well, why should we care about something if we can't observe it in experiments or in numerics? Uh, but I say, um, no, I reject that notion. I mean, I, I find this whole theory to be extremely interesting with a great deal of structure. Over the years, we've learned a great deal about um, some of the mechanisms involved, and we've Current, with new information, we've adjusted our expectations for what's going on in the MBL phase. Um, but just like in spin glasses are still a, a uh, uh, important theoretical uh, topic of conversation, um, say in three dimensions, the, the nature of the spin glass phase. There was a, a talk about a week ago, Dan Fisher um, gave an online talk and it was extremely well attended. It were like 100 people there. The, many of the big names in condensed matter theory were, were attending. And this was all about the phenomena that which could never be observed um, experimentally. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that's my perspective. Uh, admittedly, as a theoretician um, who loves uh, to probe interesting critical phenomena um, 
So anyway, I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for your patience. Yes. Yes, Anna. Just a couple of qualitative questions. So you mentioned the similarity to CAM uh, in classical dynamical systems. Um, is it reasonable to think of this limited level attraction assumption as similar to having the frequencies be like sufficiently irrational at CAM? Um, no, I wouldn't draw that analogy. Um, instead, what I would say would be um, that would be more like uh, analogous to the resonance condition, right? So that, in fact, that is the resonance condition in the context of KAM. And um, uh, so in the KAM theory, you say, okay, if these conditions are violated, you have no result. Um, that would be analogous to saying, well, it, if you have a resonant block, you have no result. But actually my result is in some sense, uh, broader than KM because KM only pro proves it on some set of positive measure. Here I'm showing something essentially probability one. So I'm able to reincorporate um, these resonant regions. Initially they look, they look non-perturbative, but when viewed at sufficiently long distance scale in the RG, they become perturbative again. Uh, so in that way, that's uh, fundamentally different from the result in KAM. In fact, stronger, if you will. But that's a very good uh, point, though. Yeah. So just something slightly related. You prob um, here again. Uh, yeah. You've probably already accounted for this, but also in uh, CAM, there's this thing that the value of the equivalent of gamma kind of scales down exponentially with the number of particles. Is there something here, or is gamma like? fixed and constant? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I, I think of KM as a prime, essentially a few body problem. And um, so um, the KM condition is more, um, uh, well, you know, there is this, essentially the, it's a condition on the de degree of perturbation theory, right, is, in, is involved in that condition. Um, so in some loose sense that might be correspond to the N and the LLA, but, um, but I wouldn't necessarily, um, find that very strong resemblance there. Okay. Leo. I'm sorry, Anna. maybe first Anna because you can do. Uh, so maybe I missed, so it doesn't necessarily rule out to the existence of MPL in two dimension, right? As if I understand correctly. Correct, yeah, I don't have any results, positive or negative in two dimensions. Yeah, but David Hughes show, showed an argument based on, of course, this, um, uh, this uh, is a glorified version of Mott's argument uh, presented by Wojtek Rook and other companies, which actually implies that the uh, threshold will move has to increase the number of ladders from quasi 1D to quasi 1D towards 2D, and eventually should go to zero. So I understand the elements of these two arguments are different uh, because it doesn't look like it rules out MBL in 2D, whereas their argument does. Well, um, of course, if, if you step away from attempts at rigorous results, then um, I mean, certainly there are strong theoretical reasons to believe that there is no MBL phase in 2D. And um, uh, because of these pictures which I put up there, that, you know, the scaling is all wrong. And um, so, but, <clears throat> but I'm separating that from the, this proof. Uh, uh, so, Based on your one of your early slides, you, you said that this is um, the wave functions are localized in Fox space, or can they be multifractal? Um, 
yeah, so yeah, that's a somewhat vague statement that I made, but um, uh, and I had I didn't actually address that in the proof, so um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I, I think that if you attempted to look at an IPR measure, let's say, um, that you would get. Um, and answer indicating sort of a localized um, structure of the eigenstate. In Fox space. Well, um, yeah, perhaps that was a, we're not really doing Fox space here, but <laughs> unless you could call the spin slip basis a Fox space. Um, so perhaps that was a poorly chosen word. I'm, I'm working in the spin configuration space. Okay. Maybe one more last question. Um, last so question. I, I want to follow up on, on that last point that you made. Um, in like the spin configuration space, if you look at the IPR, I thought that like a constant density of resonances in the state would send like the, the IPR to zero. Is that not the case? Um, well, yeah, you're getting a little bit outside of my realm of knowledge, but um, I believe that the, you know, the IPR measure should go as an exponential in the volume, but it would be um, a different exponential from what you would see in the extended phase. You can't really escape the exponential dependence, but it would be a, an exponential with a small Three factor rather than ex rather than an exponential with a log two as a as a three factor. I see. So it's it's in some sense still delocalized in Fox space in the sense that the IPR goes to zero, but it doesn't go to zero like as fast as it could. Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of an analogy of the eigenfunctions as being well, they're they're almost like a stat mac ensemble, if you will. In some some points of view, and if you were to take, let's say, I don't know, like in classical Ising model, recoupling, then the free energy of that would be very close to zero, but it would always be positive. And so, essentially, you with this analogy, the free energy, if you will, of these eigenstates has to be positive, just on general grounds, um, <clears throat> but quantitatively, it's going to be different. Uh, the coefficient of the exponential would be different in the localized phase from the extended phase. Yeah. Really last question because we already have to, for the break. Yeah. Do you think that, or maybe it has been done, I don't know, uh, to do a numerical procedure that would be inspired in these sequential steps that you're doing? So, you know, hierarchically. Well, um, yeah, and in, in what approx that's always the question, what approximation? Um, and um, you would try to do a numerical procedure or, or, or devise, maybe devise a hierarchical model. I would be, uh, I think it would probably be difficult to devise a hierarchical model for this phenomenon. Um, but maybe not impossible. Um, but <clears throat> if we maybe it would be better to revisit this question after tomorrow's talk, where where I do <clears throat> introduce not a hierarchical approximation, but other suitable RG approximations, which lead to um, uh, equations that actually can be solved. Okay, so let's maybe take a break now and thank the speaker again. Just two short announcements. So there is a group photo at 3.30. So uh, uh, we are around somewhere near the atrium. And uh, the speakers are requested to uh, send their slides so that they can upload uh, in their website so that people can access them. So thanks very much. <laughs>